Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome back to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, Episode 4, April 30th, 2018. For this episode, we will be continuing our discussion from last time of The Final Empire, Book 1 of Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. Um, this time with a lot more Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we would, like to, we would like to apologize. Uh, last time we had a few technical difficulties, but... We convinced Jordan to forego his vow of silence this week, and hopefully we'll have a lot more discussion from him. Alternatively, okay. Jordan figured out what hotkeys did what, so the thing that lets me unmute my mic didn't mute it in a different program. Sure, Jordan, you didn't join the Steel Inquisitors, <laughs> uh-huh. Um, anyway, so... as Sorry, I fiddled and switched my mic off. As always... We've never had <laughs> issues with that. <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> This show is directly supported by our listeners via Patreon.com. If you want to visit our Patreon page at Patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies, you can support us there. We appreciate any help you can give, and that's what helps us to improve the show and continue to make these episodes. Um, as always, you've heard, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Jordan and Amy. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. What are y'all up to lately? What have you been, what's been going on in your worlds? So I mentioned there was a super secret project, and here is the result. This is pretty end. cool. So and it's I have an amazing for the audio format. Yeah, I know it's it's a patch <laughs> of our logo, and it's awesome. And I figured out how to make it, and I used a, a website called Galaxy Digitizing to do it because they can make the pattern for you, so it doesn't look horrible. And I made my machine do it, and it did it. And I snipped the little threads, and voila. We have thing. So for those of you who are listening to the audio format, if you look at our logo um, on the podcast, it's the, the round image with the Cosmere symbol in the middle. Um, and all the words. And all the... Name. Exactly. So As for um, what I've, but, I've been up to, uh, mostly me and Bill were having fun looking at demographics of our audience using uh, the, the download stuff. And to our one listener in Quebec, bonjour. And merci. Merci. <laughs> merci beaucoup. It doesn't speak any French, but that was my attempt. So I, I don't yeah. know how to do a Quebecois accent. I'm sorry, but... No, we had a lot of fun looking way. it up. Apparently, we're somewhat big in Norway, and that made me happy. Ooh. We've gotten where we... Actually, after the U.S., I believe our second biggest following is in Australia. So... Awesome. I'm not going to even try, because it's going to sound completely... <laughs> Everything I can do to... is the worst... We don't want to All right, let's get ready to lose our entire Australian audience. Let's do this. <laughs> so let's forego that. <laughs> uh, and then for me, the main thing that's been on my mind lately is Infinity War, but we are not going to spoil that. So uh, I no finally comment. saw Black Panther. So no. <laughs> okay, no, no, no comment. That is no. my entire. <laughs> that's my review of Infinity War. No comment. Okay. So after after next week I should be I should be good, but not this week. So Oh man. Okay, so last time, like we said, we lost a lot of dialogue from Jordan, but fortunately we were able to keep um a lot of the back and forth between me and Amy to get mm -hmm. the main points. But even then we didn't really go over the actual plot of the book. <laughs> we we did a lot of world building look. Because honestly and characters, yeah. Right, because honestly, Scadriel is a fascinating world. It's one of the most interesting worlds that Brandon's done. And he's done a lot of worlds. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with the size of the crew, you know, it, we, it, was a, it was a heist book. It was Ocean's Eleven, or Kelsier's Eleven, as we called it. Well, and, and strangely, as good as the story is, it sort of is, like, behind the world and the characters. It sort of 
does take a back seat up until mm-hmm. about halfway through the book. Yeah. The, the characters in the world are the most interesting parts. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they're just setting up the heist. So there's a lot of background stuff that you as the reader are not seeing. You're knowing that things are happening, but you don't see them. Right. Speaking of which, there is one scene where they where everybody gathers together, and we, they sort of introduce the characters. And as I was looking at it this time, it re- it really does sort of match up with an Ocean Eleven, where they introduce this character and they say, "Okay, this is the guy who does that." And so, I, as I was reading it, and I kept coming across the different points in the plan, I just heard this little dun 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 dun. You know, sort of how they have that epic spy music in the background while while uh, you know. Um, while Ocean is explaining the planet, said, "Okay, we go here, and we go here, and then we go here, and there's just this driving." <laughs> and so I just I, I, I love how they, uh, you know, he, he, how he's actually able to make it work in a medieval setting, yeah, with, with fantasy. So, but when we're looking at the plan, what was their original plan? Because okay, so let's step step back a bit. First off, the first thing we see, of course, is Kelsier in um, the nondescript town nondescript plantation Mm -hmm. um opening words were ash fell from the sky okay i gotta take a side note here so you know those memes that go around on facebook where it's like um look at page 237 of the book closest to you and the first sentence describes your love life or something like that Mm -hmm. i saw one where they just said take the book closest to you and look at the first line and then add and then the fire until the fire nation attack <laughs> and and miss born was right by me i pick it up i was like ash fell from the sky until the fire nation attack and i was that like okay, work. sure why not <laughs> anyway so he's at the plantation talking to ska figuring out okay basically establishing this area is a crap sack world this mm-hmm. is just not a fun place to be um and you know, basically, he goes on, and it's really an, an interesting setup. Now, when I first read Mistborn, it took me three times, three tries to get through the prologue before I actually got into the book proper. Mm-hmm. But after going, after being hooked, I've gone back and looked at it, and it does a good job of really setting up the world. It just took a little while to grab my int- attention that first time, because we find out, you know, the line "Kelsier Birds Ten jumps into jumps into my mind, and suddenly it's like, okay. This is something different. I'm hooked. What am, what am I listening to? Right? Or mm-hmm. reading? Um, and so we've basically got our setup. But then, you know, Kelsier is our main character from there. And at that point, I'm thinking, okay, Kelsier is the main character of this series. Here we go. And then suddenly, there's this girl, and awesome I have no girl. idea who she was. Right? <laughs> so tell so tell us about tell us a little bit about Vin. Vin is is very much scrounging around, trying to hide in the shadows, scraping by, um, and part of a, a thief crew, and she's just um, she has the ability to burn some metal, but she doesn't realize what she's doing. She just calls it burning her. I think she, it's her using, luck. Using her using your luck, mm-hmm. and so she can like just nudge people's emotions a little bit here and there and just to kind of keep the the boss from hurting her more than she wants to be hurt not that she wants to be hurt at all but to keep her you know from and then helping out in jobs and stuff now now if alamancy is fueled by metal though how did she get the metal to burn well there's ash falling from the sky all the time and the planet has a ton of metal so she's getting it from water yeah the the the, the potential the potential sources, if I recall, they're mm-hmm. talking about. You have the the fact that they use silverware that has mm-hmm. pewter. Yeah, pewter, pewter. Yeah, has pewter, which explains how she survives a lot of the beatings. The pipes are metallic in nature, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the wells like it's a naturally very mineral rich mm-hmm. world, and so people are just going to naturally get it. It's 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 actually kind of brilliant because the the big the bigger thing where they talk about how you have to snap first. Well, Vin's lived a very hard life, so she would have snapped very early. And it's one of the things that uh, Kelsier, when he first starts training her, it finds impressive about her is how she instinctually burns the metals mm-hmm. and how naturally she does it. Because unlike Kelsier, who learned it like at age 35, mm-hmm. she's been burning it as long as she's basically been conscious. Right. She doesn't know that's what she's doing. 
but it's just second nature to her. Yeah. Okay. And so, she... so Vince had a hard life. How did she come to be part of Cayman's crew? Cayman's. Um. So her brother gets her mm-hmm. in. Like they've been hopping from crew to crew. I think is what it is. Right. And so he gets her into the group, and then he ditches her. Yeah, and he he so. sort of breaks her. Oh, in, yeah. in a few ways because he just mm. he he himself is paranoid, and so he's taught her this same paranoia. He, he says to her the whole time that they know each other, everyone will betray you, even me. And so she's got some trust issues. Rain is Rain is one of the most interesting characters you'll never meet mm-hmm. because you learn so much about him and then have it all turned on its head. Absolutely. And it's it's beautiful because, first of all, you actually can probably rightly claim Rain is the most genre-savvy person in the entire Mistborn series. He's the only, like, was he paranoid? Yes. But he had 100% reason to be paranoid. Oh, and, really paranoid if they're, if they're actually out to yeah, get you? Yeah, and they were. The entire government was out to get him. Mm-hmm. And the scariest parts of the government were out to oh, get yeah. them. Yes. And they're scary. And it's just one of these things. And the thing that I love about him is he is, my, like, every single man in Vin's life a horribly flawed individual Mm -hmm. and he like he does beat her like now he's doing it from a place of sort of love where he's trying to beat into her these lessons because he feels like it's the only thing that's going to keep her alive but you have to remember that that he's got a twisted childhood too oh yeah you know about their mom that he did not have a good source of parental you know, no, anything. and so it's just. So, I mean, you can't you can't sit there and go, well, oh, no, he, that's the only kind of love he knows is mm-hmm. the violent, horrible. Well, it's just it's just one of those things. You look at every like, no one in this book series acts irrationally given their set of circumstances. Mm-hmm. Right. That you can pretty much understand. There's very few people you're like, oh, what a dirt bag. Like even by the end of like, obviously this isn't this book, but even the Lord Ruler. Like at the end, you're like, oh, huh, yeah. There's like, yeah. not. I'm not gonna sit here and like, like the only He's person, person, the only like two people who are complete dirt bags. We meet one in this book in Ellen's father. Straff Venture is oh, just the epitome of scum. And we'll get to the fun of Straff Venture more so in the next book, but uh, the other one is also in the next book. One of the the merchants is pretty scumbaggy. But, oh right, 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 right. Yeah, on the council. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. other than that, everyone else has very good reasons and, and logic behind what they do. Well, well that's. I guess there's one minor character, the the uh, the lord that Kelsey or kills at the very beginning. He's oh. yeah, yeah. He's, he's pretty... <laughs> I'm like, I don't see any good reason for anything he does. His only purpose for existing is to say is to show. How this awful. is stunning. <laughs> well, and there's some. Sorry, going back to the intro, you were talking about it shows off something interesting. Brandon tends to do with his prologues, which is he either gives you a character that you're not going to get many viewpoints from, or a setting you're not going to get many viewpoints from mm-hmm. in his prologue, typically. And it's I find it interesting that he to set up this world where most of the story is going to happen in Luthadel, he goes to this tiny little plantation that we'll never see again. You it's do not just see the setting, though. Character, though. Now, that, that's actually an interesting story. Um, you're talking about Menace? Yes. Uh, is that, I, can, I can never remember that. The, the old Ska. The okay. old Ska guy. Yeah. So, his, you know, he, he shows up later on in the book when Kelsier goes to visit the caves, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But apparently, he, he wasn't originally planned that, like that. That would, I can't remember if it was recommended by his editor or if it was just sort of a thought that he that came to him when he was writing, but he realized he needed sort of a voice from within the ranks. And mm-hmm. so as he was thinking about it, he, was, he realized he's already there. You know, Menace, because you know, at the very beginning, he sent him to the caves. And yeah. suddenly he just said, well, why don't we bring him back? You know, he was originally supposed to be a one-off just one little random scene moment yeah and so yeah it actually that does it becomes a nice little payoff Mm -hmm. because it's also a very honest scene between him and kelsier that kelsier can't have with the crew 
Well, and yeah. Kel- and and Menace is a very interesting character too. Cause he's, I mean, he's beaten down, but he's always been very, very just upfront. Yeah. You know, he he tells it like it is. He's not. You know, he steps back and lets other people. You know. Well, and your introduction to him is how difficult it is for him to move, and how maybe today will be the day I just don't get up, and they'll <laughs> finally kill me. But he doesn't. And so it actually introduces the theme of Kelsier's entire thing, which is survive. Yeah. And mm-hmm. this guy embodies it. Well, and he passes it bit. on to other people through his, you know, he keeps talking about how he has hope. Yep. And that's how he passes on the idea of survival. He's like, with hope, that's how you're going to survive. And it sort of becomes a theme of the book, if not the series. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, in spite of everything, you just keep going. And it's sort of the whole determinator trope. Just, you know, as much as gets thrown at you, you keep on going. And somehow you make it through. Yeah. Well, and that's especially true if you look at Kelsier's plan. Mm-hmm. They hit several uh, bumps in the road with the plan where you, p- whole parts of it just come apart. Right. I think. We didn't discuss what the plan was yet. I'll, yeah. Yeah. We got sidetracked. And... Actually, that's a a pretty good... Well, and, and we got sidetracked because I wanted to step back before they were making the plan. Yeah. And so, you know, we went we looked and we saw Vin, and then, of course, Kelsier comes along with Doxon. He, guys, Doxon is probably my favorite member of the crew. He's fun. Just because he's just sort of there. Mm-hmm. But he's always making things happen. He, he's Do- very, Doxon is the grease of the engine. <laughs> He really is. He's the one who makes things happen. You know, he doesn't have any alimentic powers, but everything would fall apart without him. Mm-hmm. And, and so, he, he's the one who elicits our tagline. Because it's, does, it's right. Tim and Kelsey are looking for oh, yeah. booze. And, well, the first time. It, yeah. there, there's a, it, it comes up a few times. Yeah, but just but, yeah. the the fact that he's he's like, no, I checked that drawer, and it's like <laughs> hidden hidden behind it, and it's like there's always yeah, another like secret. hidden behind the other hidden thing. You just mm-hmm. keep looking. Yeah, you go a few layers deep, and that's where you actually find. We must go deeper. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, I love that Vin is sitting there watching them as they do this. Now, now I love how Vin is sort of recruited into the crew. Because you know, she's into the crew. <laughs> conscripted into the crew. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Well, it's it's it's, it's mutual because that's right after she you know going to the plot where she's with Cayman. Oh, right. They have Cayman. Cayman tries to do the backstab, mm-hmm. and it expose basically the whole thing ends up exposing Vin, and the whole thing was a plot anyway to see right. if Vin because there's like oh this crew is doing this, blah, 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 this is fishy, and they find out, yeah, okay, they have an Allomancer, and not only were they on the Steel Inquisitor's radar, they were on Kelsier and Dox's radar. Right. Because mm-hmm, of Marsh, right? Oh, that, oh yeah. That least the, yeah. The, what, just one of the cooler scenes at the beginning, just because it's from Kelsier and Dox's perspective, where they're like, yeah, no, she totally burned it. And so, <laughs> and so this is, it's like, yeah, that's good. And, uh, and then, like, Kelsier looks, or it might have been Dox who looks first, but one of them sees it's like, is that the obligator there? Yeah, that's bad. And then, like, the Steel Inquisitor, like, steps out, <laughs> and they're like, okay. That's really bad. Um, He's just got real. Well, and, uh, what I love is the the very subtle, like, it shows the Dox Kelsier relationship where. Kelsey is like, can you take out the obligator to Dox? And Dox is offended. And he's like, yeah, I've been doing a lot of desk jockey stuff, but I can handle myself against one obligator. <laughs> and, I can handle that. And then he's like, okay, you do that. I'm going to take on the Steel Inquisitor. And Dox is sort of like, um... Excuse me? Well, because... The thing is, he's A, not used to Kelsier being misboard. B, Kelsier is foolhardy enough that he is seriously like... He's, he might try it. He might try and fight this guy. <laughs> and he's like, no, Dang no. He might succeed. Yeah, and he's like, and he's like, no, no. I'm just going to sort of uh, try and lead him away. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, and like, he then like t- 
tugs on the guy's the inquisitor's emotions real I hard. I thought he like yanked he just, on it. He, he just, like, on he it. like, oh, let's just yeah. And the guy, you know, those and those horrible steel eyes turn to him and just oh, let's have a chase, horror. you and I. Yeah. Now th this actually brings in an inter interesting point we talked about last time is the concept of all or nothing. You know, because with because they didn't make tests to make sure that Ven could burn everything, but he did notice that she burned two things. And as soon as you burn two things, you have all of them. And so it was just like, we're not just recruiting an Alamancer. We're getting a Mistborn. We're recruiting a Mistborn, and this is a big deal. Well, yeah, I mean, they hammer home how rare Mistborn are. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to think the number we actually see throughout all the books. Oh, we, have, we have... About five oh, or six. Well, we don't yeah. want to give away names from the future ones yet. No, I'm not going to say any names. No, I'm just trying to think. Go, keep going. I'm I know going. There's, there's three in the first one that I know of. And then you add at least one more in the next one. No, I'm but, terrible at remembering how many more. And there's there's, there's, there's the four. One. There's four in the first one. Uh, four? Sh yeah, Shan has uh, one that's with her. Oh, that's, that's right. right. That's I forgot right. about yeah. that. It's, it's a nameless one. So. Oh, yeah, and then the second one, the beginning of the second one, there's a, a nameless one, too. Yeah, there's a nameless mm -hmm. one. Uh, and there's a named one. Yeah. And, well, and then in so 11th I Metal, mean, there's two more. Then I think one yeah. more after that. I think yeah, we're it's, we're it's like still, a ten, it's nine a small or ten number. in the entire book series. Especially yeah. when they start using thugs and coin shots as mooks, as throwaway mooks. Yeah. So they're sort of the cannon fodder, but Mistborn are are you know, in when you're playing um what's the game? The Star Wars Assault game where you have like your basically you have your mooks and then you have your Jedi's that you can sort of throw in mm -hmm. and anyway. Um, that is a good comparison. I could see. That. So I can't remember what the game was. It was it was Battlefront. Cute. Battlefront. That's the one. Oh. And so anyway, that really matters right now. So <laughs> it does. It's important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they end up bringing uh, bringing Vin in, and Kelsier and Vin have, in my opinion, one of the coolest conversations. Just because. Kelsier shatters every single one of Vin's expectations. She's thinking, okay, he's trying to use me. He's trying to manipulate me. And Kelsier basically says, here's the money. You can go. <laughs> well, <laughs> this gives it back and she's like, this is more money than I've ever held. <laughs> like, but, right. but one of the, one of the cooler scenes as far as her expectations getting shattered is actually the, you, you referenced it earlier, the... Uh, the introduction of all the various uh, uh, members of the crew mm -hmm. and Vin's just there and they all think she's just the twixt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she slowly but surely learns about them all and it's very Vin where she's trying to make them do most of the talking she's trying to be as uninvolved as possible right. and she's getting the wow. impression there's something like to Vin it's, there's something wrong with this crew <laughs> Well, and at one point she says something that I think Kelsier finds slightly upsetting and she immediately cringes, makes herself look small. And Kelsier finds himself just thinking, okay, she's, you know, you know, why, you know, she's, she's so insignificant. She's not something I need to worry about. And he stops and he that, says, it was, it was right after they found out, uh, Cayman's crew had been yeah. slaughtered. And, and he just, you know, he stops and he says, she's manipulating my emotions. I have never felt a touch so subtle, mm -hmm. which comes back in a really cool way in the next book. But we'll talk about that one next week or not just next just, episode. So, yeah. Yeah. Really letting her train with Breeze was baby. Oh, gosh. I love her training <laughs> sessions with each of them. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. But, but I think Breeze, Breeze and Marsha's in particular were just yeah. so good. Mm -hmm. Bre Breeze just because it gives you a glimpse into his mind and how he works and how he thinks and gets Vin to sort of come around to his way of thinking as far as mm -hmm. it comes like not as uh, overtly manipulative but understanding the the gradient of what they're doing mm -hmm. and how it's it's more about how you actually have to read them as okay, opposed I feel to. Like I feel like Brandon kind of saw it as an exercise of, you know, we've got this magic system. What does it mean? It's not just, oh, here's something cool I can do. It's you put this in the hands of a real person and see how it evolves and how they develop with it and how mm -hmm. they learn to utilize it. 
Um, and that's one of the th- strengths, I think, of Brandon's writing is that he makes it, he tries to make his characters as real as possible. Um, you know, he'll play with tropes and stuff like that, but he will try and look at where somebody came from and where they're going and where that puts them right now. And mm-hmm. then throw in a, a different factor like magic because that's what's cool about magic systems. How do they change things? How, do, how does this affect regular life? How does this affect regular people? Because essentially that's what the characters are supposed to be, be is real feeling people. Yeah, and it's, it's really refreshing to read his characters and sit there and go, you could totally take pretty much any character and put them in their own story. Mm-hmm. And you might not be as interested in that story because you may not be as interested in what would happen to them, but they feel like they could very well be their own protagonist. There's Whereas a lot of other fantasy books, you look at it and you're like, and there's random village number three. And they yep. pass through. Well, no, and- that's Hoyt. <laughs> <laughs> but he does true. it with flair. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, but the other the other thing he does very interesting compared to some other uh, speculative fiction writers I've read is he does a really good job of taking what you've seen and making it a component in the story, but sort of a new way. Because like if you think about Vin going to the balls, that's sort of like My Fair Lady, but with magic, and yeah. it's combined with trying to scam people, and it's it's a very interesting. Uh, very interesting take on it where mm-hmm. it has all the court intrigue but it has the additional intrigue of she doesn't belong mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. she's not supposed she's to belong there. well it's not just she doesn't belong it's if somebody finds out who she is she's dead yep yeah and so you know they you there's, that, there's that scene where that where like a random servant ska gets pulled off to the side and killed mm-hmm. and she sees it and, she, and i mean it's just right there and that right. could be her if they found out who she really is Right. Um, now, I actually want to go back to something that you were talking about, Amy, where you said each of these could be their own protagonist, their own protagonist. in a different story. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that Brandon talked about on Writing Excuses. Like, early episodes, they even talked about this. There's a, a concept of everyone is the hero of their own story. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen and, that quoted in different things. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, each episode of Writing Excuses, they have a writing prop. And I remember, I think it was that same episode, the writing prompt was, take a scene and describe it from three different characters who are in the room. You know, mm-hmm. just And make it com- completely different, but have it be from their perspective. So what do they notice? What do they see? Um, the same concept of you have three different people ride through a town. Write mm-hmm. the same scene from for three different people. And how does it come out different? Mm-hmm. And it create it builds the world and it builds real characters and so, and it helps you to develop that insight of how the characters will think. And so, yeah, because you want when you're writing, you want your characters to each have their own goal for each scene. I think I don't remember it probably was from writing excuses, but they said you know in each scene you need to make sure that each character who's in it has their own goal, even if you don't see anything of it. But if you do it with that in mind. Mm -hmm. then your characters are going to feel so much more fleshed out than just, I'm random Joe Bob standing here, just hanging out. Or when when you have a character who exists only to be a love interest. Mm -hmm. Those those are so sad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because they're usually the women who are just kind of there. Yep. And, you know, we're, you know, that's gradually changing, but it's... Yeah, it is getting better, but there's... There's still it's a ways so to really go. So. That. That's the the ball scenes in this. I think really pushed the idea of the women not just being there, but using being there as a weapon. Because mm-hmm. we we saw like what Shan was doing, but the one that really left an impression on me oh. was Cliss. Yeah, oh. Cliss was just Cliss was mm. perfect. I love I loved when she dropped her facade, and it's just like, oh, Vin, you got and played. It, it was just this little air it happened. Here. So fast. Yeah. That was the thing that was really cool. I love because it, well, because it's just Cliss finally sees. Okay, the mask has lost its use. Let's do this. Yep. <laughs> and it's so. It was so cool. Like of all the characters, we don't know what happened to them. I want to know what happened to Cliss. It could I, go either way. With oh, her. I she know. Could make it, out like a thief, or she could be so screwed. <laughs> guys, don't let me forget this because this is a something from the second book. Uh huh. But the scene. There's a meeting between two leaders in an in a camp, mm-hmm. and I just realized that there's a 
there's a big parallel between this one and that one. Don't let me forget that next time, okay. next episode, gotcha. because that's, a, that's something I definitely want to talk about. Okay, so now that we've gotten... Uh, you know, Ven is now a part of the crew, mm-hmm. and everybody starts... You know, Kelsier calls everybody together, and he put he has like a chalkboard or something, doesn't he? Yeah, it was a chalkboard. Yeah, and so and he, I, I love it because it feels like just a modern brainstorm session. Because mm-hmm. you know, he basically says, there are no bad ideas, everything on the table, throw it out. And people throw puts, out like, ideas. He, put, he puts out the big problems, them. and it's like, okay, how do we fix this problem? How do we fix mm-hmm. that problem? And different people chime in and say, well, I could do that. I could do that thing. I could do this thing. And I love that Yen's okay. attitude is one of the problems. Oh, gosh, Yen. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing is, they did actually fix his attitude by the end of it. Now, it ended up going horribly, but at the end, he believed in Kelsier as much as any of his other people. Okay, Jordan, tell us a little bit bit about Yidden. We don't have to go all the way towards his end, but just to the beginning. Basically, the whole plot of of their plan was, we're going to actually make the Ska Revolution happen. Which has been trying to go on for like a thousand years or something. Marsh used to lead it, and Yedin took over for Marsh after he gave up like a year b- before. Mm-hmm. And Yedin is the one who actually contracted Kelsier to, for the plan. Much to Marsh's ch- chagrin. chagrin. Yeah. Like, no. Oh, he did not like that. Nope. But at the same time, it's because Marsh thought, he, Marsh thought he was still dealing with old Kelsier, who right. was in it for himself and the prophet. Right. And, and the glory. The glory, yeah. so much of the glory. <laughs> and, and now... Like Kelsier, like that's the thing Kelsier has to sell Marsh on is that no, I'm serious. I do want to do this, and it's not just because I'm an egomaniac. I acknowledge I am one, <laughs> but it's but not real for that. reasons. Otherwise, yeah, I this is a real thing. I want to do this, and this yeah, is so, the best way. Yeah. So Yedin is basically the reason everybody's here in the first place. He came up to Kelsier. He said, "All right, we've been saving money for years." We want to make something happen, and we know that you are the person who makes things happen. Well, and especially once he became a Mistborn, suddenly right. a lot of things a lot are different. I did, I did like the random comment from Breeze. He's like, well, couldn't we get more money out of him? <laughs> He's like, is that really the whole budget? And they kind of give him a look like, we've been working for how long to get all this money together, and you're going to complain about getting yeah. more? But, if, but of course, you know, it starts off with... The crew is there as a thieving crew. They're not there as a group of revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. Kelsier's idea is to turn them into that. Yeah. But that's not where they begin. Mm-hmm. Well, and you one know, of the one of the things is the other thing is the Adium cash was supposed to be their real payment. Yeah. The stuff that they had done was supposed to be the down payment. Right. Mm-hmm. But no, so, it's it no, it's a very interesting change and in, I mean that's getting a bit ahead. But that's another one of the powerful scenes is when Kelsier finally just sort of drops the facade with them. And it's like, guys, we're not doing this for the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so... That, right. Yeah, now, um, talking about... Oh, gosh, I just sort of... Like, okay, so what were the three um, main points of the plan? Because he said, you know, he, he listed out sort of a, a little outline, just point one. The problems to solve. And so they had they had to build an army for him mm-hmm. to use to, to start the revolution. Mm-hmm. They had to steal the Lord Ruler's Adium supply, and they had to sow chaos among the Great Houses, because if there wasn't the chaos, then the Great Houses could control yeah, the things. House War. And they failed in two out of three of those things. But still, they managed to do really well, mm-hmm. otherwise. And, that, that, and they, they that's did sort of the... build an army, it just didn't stay Built. very well. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't stay cohesive-ish. Yeah, you hadn't got a little overzealous. Um... Yeah. Okay, but, that, so, but that's also Kelsier's fault. Uh huh. Because yeah. Kelsier is like, no, we got this, the survivor will protect us. And let's and go he, do a full hearted that fight, too. He, can, yep. he had that fight between some of the soldiers. And Demo. He it was Demo. And that's where and, Demo and he, came from. And of course, we've already said Demo shows up later. Mm-hmm. In, not like in other Cosmere books. <laughs> that's right, yeah. But yeah, no, it's like, it's, it's one of these things. Because one of the other big lessons he teaches Vin that they sort of keep a uh, as a running theme is there's a push and a pull to everything. Mm-hmm. And so Kelsier makes them feel like, you know, the survivor will watch over them. Well, that has consequences. Kelsier wants to s- send Vin into the courts to help sow chaos and learn, get intel. 
but that has consequences as Vin starts to get a very different image of the nobles than Kelsier had. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's just all these things that Kelsier's plan is a very good plan. It's just, it's so big in scope that there are small things that get he doesn't, yeah. There. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very interesting. The, if I actually can jump ahead, I, I like the Vin noble stuff. Well, and I, how, I actually was getting ready. I was going to, the next question was, okay, so what is Vin's role in this plan? She's there to look pretty and to get information from the nobles. She's not there to look pretty. She's there to infiltrate noble society. She does that by looking pretty. She she gets to look pretty too. (laughs) She does that by looking pretty, but she's not there to look pretty. (laughs) I love how the first she hates the dresses, and by the end of it, she's finding excuses to stay in them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Suddenly, she's Mm -hmm. got these options that she never had her whole life. And so part of it is this is something that was forbidden to me, something that was a symbol of what I could not do. Well, and it would top, make her vulnerable. Yeah, because on top of it, she, it wasn't just that she couldn't be a, like, she had a noble half to her that she always had to hide. She also right. had to hide that she was a girl. And so suddenly yep. showing her feminine side, which is something Reen literally beat out of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. is very weird for her at first. Yeah, and, and, and walking in a dress versus walking in pants is very different. It constricts how you can move quite a bit. Absolutely. Unless you get the combat dresses that she tries oh, to get later yeah. on. <laughs> I, did, I did find a random picture that shows you how to actually move your loins, and I'm like, if you can do that, yeah, I guess the dress wouldn't be quite as bad then. But most of your leg is exposed then, so... Anyway, I'll well, given her that. fight with Sean, and a whole lot she more just, is exposed. She just takes off the dress and she just wears the underclothes and she's good. <laughs> so, yeah. That's Under our thing. fight, let's do this. I'm ready for battle. I'm Vin. Oh, I'm trained by Kelsier. Who needs armor? Bring it. <laughs> All right. So, Amy, yes. let's talk about um, about Ellen. Let's talk okay. about Vin's first meeting with Ellen. Tell, tell us what happens. Um, so she sits down at a table kind of off by herself and she has, says it like, this, this is at he, one of the balls. This is, this is, I think is her first ball, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's her first ball. So she's, she's not aiming to really do a whole lot. He tells her, you won't have to dance. You can say this is my first, you know, thing. And then I'm, I'm a little too nervous about it or whatever. So they shouldn't bug you too much about it. And then who sits at her table, but Owen, because he brings his big stack of books and sets it on her table. And she's kind of sitting there going, WTF, what do I, what do I do about this? This guy's being obnoxious, and he's just there, and he won't go away. So tell us about Ellen. What what is like? How, how does he behave around her? Who who does oh, she he's... see him as? I'm forgetting who the exact comparison is, but she kind of thinks he's like kind of kind of buffoonish almost a little bit, and just kind of irritating. Fish. And yeah, I'm I'm fuzzy on some of the details. More, it, but not even so much buffoonish as obnoxious. She that, seems... Yeah. You know, like he's he's of... he's disheveled intentionally. Yeah. Um, and the and she fun can thing, tell, she can tell that he has nice clothes, but he's, he's, he dresses them badly or whatever, and so they look bad on him when they really shouldn't because they're nice clothes. But the fun thing is, she has no idea who he is. Yep, she doesn't even have any idea who he is at all. And like she knows is... there's some random girl who's glaring at her, mm-hmm. but that's after he mentions. Um, but yeah, that was his, it. Was his date. Yeah, so he yeah. he is the he is the heir <laughs> of the richest house, the most powerful house in the entire empire. Mm-hmm. The only people more powerful than his father are the Steel Ministry and the Lord Ruler himself. So and... she jumps into the deep end unintentional, and like the funny thing is, is that she has no idea why he's there, and she's and so I think Saza's like, oh, he's just trying to mess with you, and and turns out that was his table. <laughs> he had no intention of causing any problems at first. That just yeah. happened to be the table that he liked. Yeah. Well, that's where he always hung out. At the, yeah. And, that, and that's, I no think, idea. one of the reasons that they were able to realize who it was, because that's where he would always go mm-hmm. to hide, because he didn't want to be part of the festivities. He wanted to just go and read his books. I just and love I totally it. Would, get that. I just love it when Sazed, like, shows back up, and he's like, and he's like, how was it? And he's like, oh, an obnoxious boy came over to my table. Oh, who? We, you know, Kelsey or Mike. points it out this way. Yeah, Kelsey or might want to know him up there. And, like, the color leaves Sazed's face. He's like, oh, no. 
Oh, God. Oh, no. What did you do? I didn't do anything. I sat at a table. <laughs> he sat down. <laughs> it's not my fault. But I, I do love how it. she turns it on him later and, and um, gets, it's just like, oh, well, he's just a family friend and, and he's just... He's just shepherding me, so you can ask me to dance anyway. To the guys who were nervous about coming over to ask her to dance. Didn't she oh, say really? he was like he's like a favorite uncle? Like I swear, like that. Just a brother. Brother. Yeah, it was, it was, it was totally something. like give it in the shaft that way. And I think he's in hearing range too. <laughs> what happens? But I think she said much back. older brother too. Like much she, older brother, just like well, and then, I'm and then it in. yeah, and then he comes back and he's like, "So what happened?" She tells him what happened, and he looks at her. He's like brother because he's thinking i like this girl and suddenly she's absolutely friend zoned him in the worst possible way mm -hmm. aggressive it was a very aggressive friend zoning uh -huh. oh yes then again vin doesn't know how to go on the defensive she only goes on offense oh she, she yeah. really is that's vicious. the best defense is an aggressive offense in her book yeah right there but yeah, and that, but that's the thing is that the next ball, what happens is he just sort of plops down at her table with a bunch of books, and nobody's gonna, nobody's asking her to dance because Ellen's right adventure <laughs> is sitting at her table, and clearly she's taken. Well, and I love that some of the discussions they have where she sort of strangely is like, "You have a duty," <laughs> and it's like, "Ah, oh, yes." Person who's trying to just take down the entire empire, tell him about his royal duty. <laughs> and it's funny because she's just like, you know, maybe you can sit here and play games to piss off your father, but some of us actually have like a reason to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of causing a problem for me. Yeah. And it's what sort of gets him to start acting different. Right. Yeah. Well, suddenly it, per it gives him a little bit of perspective that he never had because he's grown up. Super privileged. And not only super privileged, surrounded by super privileged people that he has grown to despise. Yeah. And so he thinks that she is just another part of that. Um, honestly, that that's one of the most delightful parts is when he realizes that, oh, she's she's a spy trying to take down the Empire. She's not trying to use me. She, I love or that. No, this, she, or no, she's a thief. That's what he is. She's yeah. a thief because it's, it's after the assassination attempt on him. And he's in a, the carriage of this friend after hearing away, having run away, but he doesn't realize it's an assassination attempt. Right. He just thinks that there was some scuffle up on the roof, and, and there was a whole bunch of suffering going on, and and he, he's like, oh wait, wait, she's a scar, she's a scar thief. She's not out to like do the whole political crap. She's she just wants to steal my money. <laughs> she just wants to make some money, and she may not have even a target. But it, but it makes sense because again, he's sick of being surrounded by fake people, and mm -hmm. while she is pretending to be somebody else. She's not doing it to manipulate somebody. She's doing it to survive. Yeah. So it's not a selfish. I mean, it, I mean, it, it is for her own, you know, benefit. But it's not to harm As, anyone. It's yeah. very. I mean, it's just sheer survival. And so he realizes, you know, she's not trying to manipulate me through politics. She's not one of these shallow people who uses people not, as pawns. She's, she's not just, part of the same political machine that he's yeah. supposed to go. Well, and then there's she's also... Trying, she's working against the same political machine that he's working yeah. against. Well, and then there's also the slight fact that it also proves uh, something he was interested in, which was what makes Ska and Nobles a different, and her mere it's existence not proves mm -hmm. not much of anything. Right. The fact that nobody realized that she was Ska. Because he, he makes her really nervous in an earlier conversation because he's like, oh, wait, you, you've actually talked to Sky. You know them. You know a little bit about it. And she's sitting here going, yes, but I can't tell you that I am one and that I hang out with them all the time. Well, and she, yeah. she, so she, she takes the she imitates what she thinks she's supposed to say because she's like, well, I'm a noble lady. So I'm supposed to say what a noble lady would say. And he seems a little disappointed by her responses. Mm -hmm. But then later on, I think it all clicks with part of his thing. He's like, oh, she was probably worried about. And that if helps us to, answer. that helps us, because we don't get any, or very few, Ellen perspectives. But that, mm -hmm. just the fact that he's disappointed when she says something. I think we only get the one. I think you're right. Um, but and, no, but the thing is. Is it the end? Or is it, oh, that's the beginning of the second book, sorry. I'm, I just started yeah, the second one. We again. get very, very few yeah. in this book from Ellen. And, so, but this is a way of showing who Ellen is as a character without making it perfectly clear. 
because you know, mm-hmm. once you get a viewpoint from a character, you understand them a lot better. Mm-hmm. And this was a really interesting way of establishing his character without delving that deep into him. Well, the other thing that was interesting about him is how literally everyone in the crew is telling Vin, oh, you know, don't get too invested because he's just using you. Mm-hmm. And now Sezed and Kelsier and Doxon and all of them have different theories as to why he's using her, mm-hmm. but they're all convinced he's just using her. Right. And she's like, no, it's like, it's not that. Like, you guys haven't met him. Right. And it's actually through that interaction that even at the very end, it sort of changes Kelsier a little bit. Because at the very end, in the in the Survivor scene, when he sees Ellen there, trying mm-hmm. thinking he's going to go rescue Valette, and Kelsier's like, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know how to wield a sword. What is? Why is he here? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It's like, oh, wait. And then he, he has loves a her. He could yeah. abandon, abandon Ellen, and he's like, but she loves him. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I gotta do the nice thing and save him. <laughs> Which, but that's such a huge step for Kelsier, who mm-hmm. has a, a policy of, if, you know, if it's red, it's no dead type of. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's not just throwing a wrench into his own plans. He's throwing his wrench into a wrench into his own plans to save the life of a noble. Yeah. And not yeah. just a noble, again, the heir of the ventures. And so. Yeah, yeah like his again. father physically struck him in this book. Oh, that's right, he did, when he was pretending to be an informant. Well, not just that. His father runs the pits of Hafsin. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's right. Does he know that, though? He doesn't know that yeah. until... No, he knows it at that point, because he's yeah, he already... Because oh, the whole right. reason for that scene was... Uh, oh, that's right. Was because uh, Kelsier destroyed the pits. Right. Mm, that's right. And so... Man, it's... Um, wait, should we maybe you start... talk about... Did you want to talk about the Rose Window Bill? Yes. This okay. So this is one of the most like the most powerfully burned into my mind images. And when they make the film, it better be good. And of course, the image that is burned into my mind is wrong. Give me a minute. I'm, I actually need to grab something. I'll be right back. Okay. So since we're, he's going to talk about the Rose Window. Yes. One of my favorite just mini action scenes. Not the. You know, one of the big set pieces, but just sort of... I love the Kelsier versus Vin training scene where they're full-on fighting one another. And Vin, like, screams and, like, pushes up against the coin. The coin actually folds and bends in between them. Yeah. And I love how it becomes, like, this, like... And Kelsier's like, keep it. It's kind of cool. It's a good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do like how he chats that, like, well... You're gonna have to remember the weight involved, so you probably don't want to get into a front on a front fight with someone bigger than you. Pauses, looks at her, which means you probably don't want to have that ever happen with anyone. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, everybody's gonna be bigger than you. Well, so, and I also oh, love the. Do that. You don't. I know you instinctively push your hands out. You don't need to do that. It's like you don't have to. It's like this isn't a DBZ beam fight, so. I don't remember him referencing DBZ, but I'll, uh, he I'll, did. He was a huge fan. <laughs> it's in a word of Brandon. <laughs> Seems legit. So now, okay. So back to the rose window. Okay, so we're having more visuals. This scene <laughs> is, uh, you know, this is this is basically the fight between the assassination attempt we talked about, mm-hmm. um, and it was a fight between Vin and Shanelariel, who we find out is a misborn. Go figure. It's great. Not only is her soul black, she's also conveniently someone we can fight and murder. So clearly what we've learned is that Ellen has a type because she's his former fiance. He didn't pick her, though. No, he didn't. But <laughs> I'm just saying there are two women, two main women in his life. Yeah, he was only engaged to two sport. women. So, yeah, no, okay. so um, but anyway, at one point, so they have this huge epic Brandon Alamancy fight. That, you know, where they're going all over the place, burning adium, all sorts of stuff. And at one point, they talk about these stained glass windows that are in the keep where, they're ha- where they have this ball. And mm-hmm. at one it point... It was at Keep Venture, wasn't it? I don't it think be. it was Keep Venture, actually. I, it I'll look it up. Been, I, don't, I don't think it was. Keep up with it. Any, anyway, so... But they ta- keep talking about these stained glass windows, and they keep using the term rose window. 
and I am imagining a stained glass rose. Think something like that you would find on Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have this really fancy flower in stained glass. And then I was playing a game where they were talking about Notre Dame and the rose windows, and I just thought, oh my goodness. So this is actually what a rose window looks like. This is a specific type of stained glass window. And it's that, that circle that, and so it just completely changed the image. Because what happens is, if I'm remembering right, she pulls on the frame of the window and ends up coming through. And I have this image in my mind of this goddess of death just descending <laughs> because just, oh, it's yeah. just this amazingly cinematic oh. scene. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of one of those, one of the first times where Vin shows, this is what I can do when I am under the gun. Oh yeah, she just goes. So looking it up, it was at uh, Keep Venture. It was Adventure. Because if you recall, her Hilario's plot was with Straff. Right, yeah. to kill him, to kill him on out. Venture property. To... Yeah, and so, but... That's right. The, the other thing that was amazing about that, so there's two scenes in this book where, like, I was enjoying the book up until mm -hmm. these points. This scene said, okay, Brandon has definitely earned me whatever the next book is, this fight scene. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just cinematically pleasing, but it's also very clever writing and gets to showcase Vin's best feature, which is her ability to wing it. Which, right. again, makes her definitely Kelsier's daughter. And uh, mm -hmm. But then uh, the the second fight later is like, okay, Brandon's got my undying loyalty. But this is the one that got me. It's like, he's earned at least another book with this. And specifically, where Vin realizes, and this is the part of her that's so good, because she's, she's resource conscious, because she grew up poor. And she realizes Shan looks so freaking confident. And it made her realize, she's from a great house. She has more adium than me. I'm not going to win in an adium fight. No. Okay, here's the plan. I'm going to fake her out. I'm going to do a con. Because that's what she's been trained to do, is to con people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <laughs> I'm trying to get it right where she like fakes out that she's run out of adium. Shan goes in for the kill. Vin turns on the adium at the last second catches a freaking arrow in the middle of the air. And then she and catches the second one. Yeah. And, and just jams it into her. And it's just like, boom, checkmate. Jam what now? Okay. There were two. Because she, I remember there were two. Mm -hmm. But it was so... She maneuvered her into the arrow. Did I... I pretty sure she, I don't remember. Pretty sure she caught it. Like, and stabbed her I think, yeah, it. I do remember she caught one of them. Like she, yeah, I thought she me. caught one, but I, I, for for some reason, I thought she saved hers. Had Shan use hers up, and then I, I could, I must be remembering. So wrong. they're both using the ADM. Yeah, they're both using the ADM, and, and Shan is, yeah, because mm -hmm. Shan isn't going because uh, she realizes Shan isn't going on the offensive, even right. though her ADM's on, and she realizes it's because she knows she has more. She's from a rich house. I'm from a poor house. She right. knows she has more resources, so she's just going to sit here and wait for me to panic, run, then run out of adium, and then she'll kill me then. Yeah, and an so, attrition battle, yeah. Yeah, and so that's when Vin says, no, okay, I'm more clever than she is, let's do this. And it, it was, it's a very clever thing, and I love that it's a con. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when she talks to Kelsey or later, and he's like, hey, you killed a Mistborn, and she's like, I was just kind of doing whatever, I just tricked her, and he's like, that's what elements is. You just you pull out tricks right and left. It's just full yeah. of them. But the yeah. the other thing it highlights is just how much cl more clever she is than other Mistborn. Other Mistborn have years of training, and right. she has months. But she's just she's scrappy. Yeah, she's, she's scrappy. She and, well, and she but it's she all she scrappy. she uses the fact that she hasn't been trained. Um, to, to her advantage, this is not going to make sense. to. So in Smash Brothers, someone who's better than you will beat you nine times out of ten. Mm -hmm. We had two friends named Brett and Will who played each other every single day for hours upon end because we were in college and they wasted time. So they played the game, according to pros, wrong. Because they had evolved their own little metagame in amongst themselves. They then went and played pros. The pros still beat them, but they got way further than they should have. And 
every single one of them would always say, like, you are the most annoying people to fight. You don't play right. And that's what Vin does. She doesn't play the game with other Mistborn the way that they're supposed to. She cuts the knot. And she she's so brilliant mm. in, in her tactics. And Brandon does it in a way that doesn't make her a Mary Sue. He right. does it in a way that builds her up and shows that she's like she's just clever. And I've earned mm. her being clever in the middle of a hostile situation because she's been winging it ever since she was a little girl. Right. Yeah. She's had to wing her else she wouldn't be there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there they he he definitely laid the seeds for her being clever. Again, the whole when everybody thought she was the twixt and she didn't dispel them of that thought. Because they no didn't to. pay attention to her. If you're underestimated then you can get away with a lot more than you would exactly. Normally. And it's exactly what she does against Shan. Gets her mm-hmm. to underestimate her. Yeah. Yep. And so all right, now another amazing elementic scene this is one jordan i think we'll want to talk about a little bit then and and kelsier decide to go on a little field trip um tell us about that <laughs> well which when there's two field trips that go on the really poor decision or only the slightly poor decision the first one okay the really poor decision mm-hmm. and so it's great because it's, it's actually right after their little training session where she mm-hmm. they bend the the coin between them Mm-hmm. And Kelsier goes to leave, and Vin's like, "Oh, I'm really tired." And then, like, and like, Sazed sort of raises an eyebrow, just <laughs> like, "No, you're not." <laughs> and he's just like, "Uh huh." And then she immediately leaves, and she discovers the Alamancer's highway. Um, she uh, clarify she, clarify what that is. Oh, that that was the Wait basically there was a road of spikes people had put into just the wilderness from. Uh, oh, I forget. Lufidel. Yeah. Lufidel to, to Fel, Felaris? I don't Something know. Where, where are Redu's places? Phaedrex. Phaedrex. Oh, no, no, Phaedrex. I don't know. I'll anyway. Point is, and so it's there specifically for Mistborn. And it lets her do a trip that takes, you know, a couple hours by coach in under like 20 minutes or something. Right. Because she basically gets to fly there, which is really hacks in a medieval world. And, like, she catches up with Kelsier. Kelsier's like, what are you doing here? And she's like, well, I mean, you left, and so I thought I'd follow you. He's like, okay, no, I'm about to go do something dangerous. You need to go back. And she's like, okay. Like, Kelsier turns to walk away and then turns around. You're just going to follow me, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the city's, the city's Felice. 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 That's it. Felice. That's where uh, Renew's place is. Yeah. Well. I think yeah. Phaedrix is book three. I think that's Yeoman's place. Could that's be, yeah. what it is. Okay. And so Kelsier's like, okay, well, so I was going to break into Credit Shaw. And Vin's like, isn't that like where you got oh, captured the first house? time and where the Lord Ruler lives casually? And it sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Well, except Vin doesn't say this sounds like a bad idea because Vin is Kelsier's daughter. And Kelsier gives his logic for doing it. And she's like, are we sure about this? And Kelsier's like, yes. Okay, I'll go with it. Because I, too, make poor life decisions. And... <laughs> I, too, like to live dangerous. Yeah, well, it's not just, like... The two of them are making such a beautifully shared poor decision. Because <laughs> either one could stop the problem, but no. no yes, just it, like... Yeah, let's just there's, like, it up and make it work. five different junctures at that point where one of them should have had something that says, you know, this is a poor plan. We shouldn't do this. But so, you know, try it another time, maybe. In this series, Kelsier has Doxin to temper him. Mm-hmm. Then has Ellen to temper her. Or, or, or says it. Yeah. Both of them leave them behind and decide to have fun together. This is a very bad idea. Well, and the thing that makes it so just gloriously in character for both of them is what Kelsier is foolhardy. Vin has a at this especially at this point a desperate need to prove to Kelsier that she belongs because this is the first time she's ever felt like she belongs. Mm-hmm. And it's it's this, it's a poor decision like whirlpool going between them where he's worried about her safety. And so what does a responsible adult do? A responsible adult says, "No, let's go back because you're going to be stupid and follow me." Kelsier's not a responsible adult. 
Kelsey is a man child of masquerading as an adult, and Kelsier I love him the, for it. Kelsey is the epitome of the stereotypical dad whose wife is away. Yeah, so. the one that is is not shown well. And because mm-hmm. well, my husband doesn't do that with our kids, thank you. I say it's stereotypical. <laughs> Yes. Well, and, but the the thing is, it's also the problem of Kelsier has this obsession with the credit shot because he wants to a find out if the ADM's there. He's convinced right. it's in the, there in the hidden room too. He, yeah, he almost got and he almost him. got there, and it's what led him to to losing his wife. It's part of his grudge. This isn't mm-hmm. just about finding where the ADM is. It's partly to to prove to himself that he wasn't betrayed. Right, and it's. And you combine his need to prove he wasn't betrayed with Vin's need for belonging, and it's just a bad combo, and it's why they need these moral compasses in their lives. Because if they don't have them, they make dumb decisions together, mutually. And they like <laughs> it was it was just such a bad decision, but I love them for it because it's totally believable in that situation. And it's how they get the book that leads leads the to, to Lendy's logbook in the end, and introduces so just, the concept of inquisitors fighting with triangles. I just want to take a look at chat for a second. Uh, Kate Ad, uh, Katie A. Drummer uh, just mentioned. I think I shall now introduce myself as the man child masquerading as an adult. <laughs> you strongly identify <laughs> with that. <I> guess. <laughs> So uh, apparently, uh, you've you've made an impact. I'm not sure if it's a good one or a bad one though. <laughs> I just want to know if it's K Dad Rummer or K the Drummer. Okay. I just um, don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's oh, we mystery. lost Amy for a second. She uh, she messaged me. Her, apparently, her computer decided to reboot. So oh. we'll just keep chatting for a. Okay, for a little but bit. yeah, and so she'll that's. Join us when she gets but back. yeah, so it's a poor decision. It leads to our first scene of seeing Cezed do stuff, proving mm-hmm. that he he's not just the harmless scholar he oh. pretends to be. Or thinks he is. He's a lot more dangerous. The thing is, most of it happens sort of off screen. But so, so. <laughs> what I like about it, though, because Vin then has some recovery time. She sees more of Seized and spends more mm-hmm. time with him. And it's sort of brilliant because she starts to piece together what... Oh, dear. Crap. Yeah, I think we just lost some... Oh... Uh, the, the visuals that we've been relying on so much for our audio format just look horrible without her in there. Yeah, it'll just, fix itself. Uh, it'll well, fix itself. Bear with us, it'll fix itself. So, But yeah, anyway, I'm, gonna, so I'm just going to lead more this way so I'm in frame. Uh, and I so don't know where I am. So you're, you're in her... If you lean to your left, you'll be more in Amy's circle. But this is, again, this is wonderful for the audio anyway, format. So, um, anyway, no, she sort of pieced together how it works, how Farukami works a bit. And it's very much in Vin's sort of style of figuring things out. Right. Where she figures out, wait a minute, okay, no, he's wearing glasses, that's weird. Why is he wearing glasses? Why is he eating all this hot soup? What's going on? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she starts to piece it all together and figure out, yes, this is why uh, what you know, how this works. And she doesn't figure out all the powers associated with it, but she figures out that it's a, a store and use system, sort of. Right. And she doesn't know the full extent of it, but it eventually leads to her learning some of the extent of it, which becomes important when she ends up fighting the Lord Ruler. Right. And it's just one of those... He it- Brandon's so good at hanging Chekhov's gun on the wall. Mm-hmm. Just showing that she can figure out these little tricks. The the foreshadowing that yeah. he, that he lays so far in advance. Three books in advance, no comment. But yeah. we'll get to those later. <laughs> yep. Okay, so um, let's see where were we? There? Okay, I really want Amy to be a part of this next uh, this next yeah. scene that we talk about. So. Um, Let's talk about what you know. What is it that Vin learns about um, about Sezed? Yeah, because most again, most of this sort of happens off screen. But you know, she notices a big figure standing over her at first, and so she, yeah, she she picks up oh, on yeah. on Farukami. Yeah, she 
she sees... I can't remember if she realizes it's Seized when she's being rescued. Um, she just... He, I think she just hears a familiar voice. Okay. But it does, she never says Seized. Okay. But, yeah, and it, like, basically some muscle man rescues her, and then she goes to Black, and then she finds out Seized rescued her, and I'm pretty sure After she's... I, She's been unconscious for like two yeah. weeks, hasn't she? <laughs> it's it's something like that because she's horribly injured. But right. I I just remember like she knows Seized saved her, but she also has the cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. di dissonance that that gives. Just the fact that, but he's a bookworm, he's a terraceman. Terracemen don't do that. But then again, he's always been a very bad terraceman. Yeah, that's so, that's one of the things that we we're hoping to do, uh, Kid Ad Drummer. We we are definitely trying to get you to want to reread these books. We, if if you listen to our podcast and you say I want to reread it, we feel we've done our jobs. Yeah. So. <laughs> let's I, actually let's talk about that logbook though, because that's the real reason for that entire absolutely like, so, cinematically. That, yeah, because once they get there, she finds this book, and. Says that starts to translate it, and they realize that it's essentially what they believe is the Lore Ruler's logbook. And as, now, as the book is going on, from you know, from chapter one, there is, there are these epigrams before each chapter, and they seem to be from this unknown speaker. And at this point, it's made clear these epigrams were from um, from this logbook. They're excerpts from it. And if you actually go back and you put them all together, it creates a cohesive narrative. Um, but we find out that it's not from... Uh, it, it's not written by the Lord Ruler. Um, it's actually written by another man who we later... I think we find out the second book's name. His name is Alindi. No, we, I think we learned it. This this time it's it's in the second book because he's actually named by the in the epigrams in the second book. By, oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. And so, oh, she's coming. She's coming. I'm coming. I promise. <laughs> My computer I'm, just like blue screened of death and like uh, and like I had some. I think Jordan talking was like, uh, and I just had to take my headphones off because it was hurting my head. Well, that's the. Um, so That's yeah, okay. you cursed we me, Bill. Thanks for the problem. for thanks for the technological curse. That was cool. Yep, we've now all had technical problems. So sequentially, I guess... <laughs> there's now balance. Anyway, <sighs> we're so talking the about the up still. No, but it's fine. Okay. But well, but yeah. I have stuff to show later. If it, you can it'll... put the video up, that'd be great. Turn on cam. Okay, I'll click the turn on camera. That, that <laughs> technology. Helps. Hey, so, we like yay! it. Welcome back. Thank you. We so were discussing about... Alendi's logbook. Yes. Okay. It's and a so, logbook. And so it's essentially, <laughs> they start reading this same book in universe, which is one thing that Brandon has done in a few works of his that I really like. Um, the whole concept behind the Stormlight Archive is them, like the, the titles of each of the books are, are books that actually exist inside of the, the universe. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with the way of kings and words. And so in this one, it's worked into the epigrams of all the different chapters. And it's through reading this that we learn that uh, that the Lord Ruler didn't write it. Nope. Um, well, no, we did. We don't learn it from reading the logbook at all. You read That's it. right. Because we later. we learn it. Vin learns it only as she's fighting the Lord Ruler after burning the 11th medal. Mm -hmm. And seeing a Pac-Man for the other person after she tries to kill the illusionary Pac-Man, and then which, doesn't she end up in the in the jail? And then she tries again, and that's what it. it clicks by the in. way, they they always pronounce it Pac-Man, and every time they say it in the audiobook, I just I just imagine waka 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 waka. <laughs> They're very good climbers, those Pac-Man. <laughs> they just go straight up. <laughs> Physics, anyway, physics. but no, it's so yeah, but it becomes very important. It's a it's a cool little it world builds. It also plays on the trope uh, in fantasy novels of this epic hero who's supposed to mm -hmm. save the day. And they think, oh, he fell from grace, and it's like, oh no, 
The epic hero never did his job. He got team killed right he was, before he was murdered goal. by his servant right before he was supposed to succeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it basically tells this story of a guy who's traveling to somewhere to take some power. And, and fulfill and fulfill a legend or or a what one of the best moments of it is Vin when she completes reading it, she's like, Say Zed, do you have the next chapter? It's like, come and, on, and, it to me. Well, I love it because she's like, I don't read. And then like she's gotten sucked in by the narrative, and he's like, That's it. That's all there is. And she's like, but it's an unsatisfying ending. And that, it's is, just, that is not how a book is supposed to end. It's, it's just kinda like how when I got Jordan hooked on the King Killer Chronicle. And there's yeah. only two books in, a tril- in the trilogy. You've told me that there's supposed to be more. I keep hearing word that there's supposed to be a third one, but... I don't think there's an actual author. I think it's a myth. I don't think Patrick Rothfuss exists. <laughs> mm. But Well, I mean, Sanderson, or, you know, Brandon Sanderson is a, just a, a team of... Robots. Of, uh, writer bots, so... But, so, we don't... We only have about 20 minutes. We have to talk about the fight scene at the square. Okay. Okay, the square of the survivor. Here we go. It's so, no, so actually, beautiful. we need to we need to take the step before that though, because the first thing that ha- the reason that that scene even happens is when basically Kelsiers find f- believes that they've killed his brother. Yeah, yeah they find mm-hmm. they find they find uh, a body, a body that's been mutilated so badly, but they believe that it is, Mark. and there's blood everywhere, everywhere. Like where, one of the comments is is. It possible for there to be this much blood inside of a human body? Twitch, you're just like, nope. <laughs> but um, well played, so, Brandon. <laughs> but what happens is this is um, Kelsier's berserk button. You know, yeah. suddenly the Lord Ruler has taken his brother, his older brother, who he looked up to, who actually inspired him eventually to take up the reins of this revolution. After the revolution has also been killed. Mm-hmm. The one who Kel- the one who Kelsier says he should have been this leader, like this was his cause. Yeah. Um, and so Kelsier destroys the pits. Kelsier says, "All right, you hurt me, I am going to hurt you." And so he goes to the pits of Hafsen, which are the source of all Adium, which is the backbone of um of the their entire, entire economy. <laughs> I mean, essentially, this is like a guy going and saying, "I am going to blow up Fort Knox," and it just, and every bit, and every well, no, but Fort Knox in particular because Fort that's where they keep the gold. Yeah, where, if we were know, still on the gold standard, right? You know, you know what? I yeah, mean. but it's it's so beautiful that he goes back to where he snapped, and, and it's it's traumatic for him too. Oh, he yeah, has to he, force himself to keep going down. Mm-hmm. We get the cool scene very short from the perspective of the guy who's looking for the ADM geode and oh, is going yeah. crazy. Uh-huh. And then Kelsier just shows up and he's just like, the survivors, go. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> get up. <laughs> come with me if you want to live. And then he just goes down, you know, into the heart of the mind and just lets loose because we, we've Alamancy learned that, that using Alamancy near the crystals that create ADM will shatter them. And so he just goes down and he says, all right, let's let everything out. And just essentially lets his entire rage just... And I've got to say, as epic as this was, as traumatic as this had to have been, that had to have been a cathartic moment. Because it's just yeah. like... just. Because he could feel each, each one of them pop, probably, or whatever else. So it was I've just heard, like knowing everything destroyed. I've heard stories about these places in Japan where it's just basically a room with a bunch of breakable things. You give them a lot of money, and you're given like five minutes and a hammer. And I just that's like, okay. A, I don't know. That's a cover band name. Five minutes and a hammer. I I, I, I must admit, when I was in Japan, I didn't know about those, but I was only there for like two and a half months, and I was there being a student, so I wouldn't know about that. It may just be like, this is a <laughs> one place that somebody I knew saw one time. It's oh, like, it's possible. You know, it I mean, it may have, not be have, lots of them or anything. They have owl cafes, they have cat cafes, they have bird <laughs> cafes, they have everything cafes. Only in Japan. And I, I kind of want to go to one, because it's so cute. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to, that doesn't seem sanitary, but... 
No, um, yeah, so that that necessitates the Lord Ruler then doing all the executions in the square mm-hmm. of Renew's staff, which spooks in one of them and renews mm-hmm. in one of them, which causes yeah. Ellen to go to try and save Valette. Yeah. He tries. And, yeah, and so Kelsey, uh, that that you have the great final line Kelsier gives to to Vin because he sees Spook down there and he's like, I'm going to go rescue him. And Vin's like, you can't, you're not invincible. And he just looks at her and tells her, you ha- still have a lot to learn about friendship. And it's such a beautiful line because then Kelsier just dives in and goes to open up what, like he opens up one of the cages and then a freaking steel inquisitor walks out from the middle of the sky. Yeah. Guys. And it's the same one that he had the the chase mm-hmm. with earlier. Mm-hmm. And I just love the just the fight that starts cuz part of it talking about the catharsis that he had at the pits of Hassan. This was another catharsis cuz he had ever since he had become a misborn, he had wanted to know, can I take an inquisitor? And so the part of him that just wants to take on a challenge, which is part of who he is, Mm -hmm. says, let's do this. And the two of them have what is still the most hardcore fight scene I've ever seen written in any book. And it's gorgeous. You expect the immigrant song to start playing in the background. Well, Ah. because this is, I've discussed this before. The problem with writing action is that paradoxically, the more detail you go into, the less skilled it tends to come out because mm-hmm. there's and a more it drags. Yeah, because it drags on. And so to explain something really cool in detail is to actually slow the, the combat down mm-hmm. when you're trying to make it feel fast paced. And not only is this fight fast paced, Kelsier and the Inquisitor both are burning Adium, meaning there are dozens of Adian shadows coming out of each and every one of them and all the things that they're moving and push and pull on. And Kelsier's doing this on purpose. Kelsier starts basically juggling a bunch of stuff just to clutter the view of the Inquisitor more. Mm. But the coolest moment has to be when the Inquisitor just grabs the cage and launches it at Kelsier. And Kelsier, instead of dodging, jumps into the cage pushes on all the bars so he's at the exact <laughs> middle and then right as it crashes push out and he just like spider-man like steps onto the wall to stop his momentum and i'm just sitting here the entire time just like i need this someone needs to make this fight i don't need the rest of the misborn film i really don't i just need this and i will be perfectly content with anything else they do as long as that fight seat is done well what else do I want in life? Nothing. <laughs> that no. in season three of Young well, Justice, then, but I'm getting that. So. And then the end of that fight, because that's just one <sighs> of the most gruesome. I mean, he nails the spikes mm. that are coming out of the guy's back of the guy's head into a carriage. Oh, and that's then so, so awesome. My gosh. <laughs> I guess one of those, Brandon, Brandon was just sort of like, okay, time to, time to let loose. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then what happens right after that? And then the Lord Ruler steps forward, and I think was like it happened so fast. So yeah, it's like so. I I want so. Did you guys read paperback or hardback for this book? Mine's mine's hardback. Bill, okay. I don't know what it's like in the hardback. I read the paperback. Kelsier, like. Like says his line to the Lord Ruler, "You, I am that would uh, you can't kill me because I am hope." Mm -hmm. And then you turn the page and he slaps him so hard, like he liquefies half his face and he dies basically. And but then he still stabs. Yeah, it was so sudden that like I'm just like he's dead. And so I go back. I'm convinced I had somehow turned two pages because it happened the same thing. Okay, so it must be. And I'm just like. No, no, I missed something. There's something... Bi- no, there is no paper in between here. Kelsier's just dead. And I that so threw me. Like, I wasn't yeah. mad because he earned the death. But it was so shocking. Because yeah. I thought Kelsier was the hero of the story. And he, was, he like, is, still is my favorite character in all books ever. But it was so shocking. Yeah. Yeah, he he didn't even 
like th there wasn't even a, a feudal struggle. The Lord Ruler just ended him. It, it was just done. Um, and it was just one of the most shocking but most effective character deaths I've ever read. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so um, good. So well okay, played. So, okay, so we we really need to, to just sort of hit the end of this because, you know, we're almost there. So, basically, at this point, Vin says, all right, we need to, we need to do this. She goes off and finds him what happened you know how does she find him like she you know she 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 gets into his or that's right she gets there's, there's more to talk about we can't get through it's too much everything it's but we, we but people next, read the but book we, yeah so we we know how it ends up so at the, at the end um she suddenly is able to draw on the mists mm -hmm. she and she's able to do a lot more than she would normally be able to do. She's mm. actually able to pull on something that is pierced in somebody's body, which is supposedly impossible. The fact yep. that she was able to draw on the mists, that's something unusual. Mm. Um, and, you know, so... Why does, again, that, so why does that work? Because it's, it's totally a deus ex machina. But in, oh. in, this, in this book, why do you think that works? And it doesn't feel... So normal because they teased it, they, they, because it's been built up. There have been several times where she's felt this drawn, and they swirl around her in certain ways, and it feels like they invite her, but only sometimes. <laughs> but it has been built that this is something that sort of happens, and it almost feels like she should be able to draw on the mists, but she can't. And when that finally happens, it's like okay, she's achieved something that's been built. That he he did leave little breadcrumbs leading yeah. up to that point. Yeah, and so. Um, but the thing about this book is it's great as a, it actually works as a standalone because the major story is over, but there's mm -hmm. two books later, two, two books after it to yeah. complete this trilogy. And so, um, so a lot of times people say which book to start with. This is a good one to start with. Elantris is one I like to recommend just because <laughs> I do feel that even though it's his weakest, it's still a good book mm -hmm. and it, if like, you, if it's you're, harder to go back to. If you're confident that whoever you're recommending Elantris to, if the person will keep reading after that, I definitely say go Elantris because it keeps improving. If you're not confident that they'll keep reading, that they need you need something that hits a bit harder, I'd say start with Final Empire. Yeah, you start with either Final Empire or Warbreaker. Yeah, I was, I've said Warbreaker because I'm like, if you want to so just make sure. It's a fun magic system and it's a one shot, so if they only really want to commit to one, then Mm -hmm. They've got an introduction I, to the cosmos. But you can say Mistborn as well, because yeah. even though it's the first part of a trilogy, it is a self, a, a completely um, in contained story. Mm -hmm. So you can finish it and not know. But there are still questions that you say, "Oh, I want more." Yeah, mm -hmm. that's well, here for for me. That's uh, what that's, I think. The next books. I think Mistborn's the best gateway drug because yeah. you know you can go get another hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas Warbreaker, um, there's no other hits you can take. Yeah, here, have a Cosmere. You know? yeah. <laughs> My hey, father-in-law uh, actually like, suggested books to a, to a, a co-worker, and he, he was going to lend a Mistborn, but then it turned out he only had two and three. So he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> With this, we had to like go find another paperback of, of number one or something. Anyway. Mm -hmm. but, uh, oh, man. I love this book. It's, I do, too. It's an awesome book, and I'm, I'm totally wanting to do Vin now. Is I am... Big. I'm, but I'm really worried about the Miss Cloak because I've seen some and I'm not as impressed with them as I want them to be. And I don't know if I can make it as cool as it needs to be. Yeah. I don't think you can because Miss Cloaks, they sound really cool. In actuality, they would get caught on everything. everything. Yeah. Miss and Cloaks, I'm sitting there going, if I am going to have tons and tons of little strips like that big. And it says like hundreds. And I'm like, hundreds, hundreds. I don't want to sew hundreds. That's a lot. I like Cade to Drummer's, uh, and I know I did it wrong, and I'm sorry, suggestion of just strap a fog machine to your back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if every con will let me do that, unfortunately. Sometimes no. I don't like you doing but that. But in all honesty, mm. there's a, a company has bought the film rights to this movie, mm. to, to the entire Cosmere. I'm a little bit worried because I wasn't impressed. With, I can't remember what other stuff that they've made, but... I wasn't impressed with it, and so I'm just thinking, uh, I really, really wish that the the 
the, the team behind Doctor Strange could make <gasps> Brandon's Cosmere stuff. Because as I was watching that movie, I saw Elantris stuff, I saw Mistborn stuff, I saw Stormlight, uh, Stormlight stuff, I saw War- I saw Warbreaker stuff, and it's all in there. And I'm just like, these are the people who need to make this. But <sighs> they, I think those guys might be tied up at the moment. <laughs> just a little bit. They they may have other things to do. Um. Okay. I was thinking we were going to take a look into secret history, but I think we'll hold off on that one until a little bit later. Yeah. Um, because we because we're we're right up, we're at the end of our time, so yeah. uh, we talk too um, much. But uh, before we end, I, as always, we want to thank our patrons who support the show at patreoncom studies. By becoming a patron, you get access to bonus content like the six seven, which is a collection of seven pieces of content that the three of us will find each week that we enjoy and we want to share with you. Um, you also get early access to any of our bonus shows, um, as well as automatic entry into any of the giveaways we have, which, Jordan, you mentioned we're getting ready to start having a few of those um, once we cross the line, the, the threshold for um, for patrons. Yep. But most importantly, what you do is you're helping us to build the show. With the help of our patrons, we're able to expand it um, to record more frequent episodes uh, if we are able to grow the show enough. And we'll also be able to improve the quality of the show with better microphones and other equipment, so we'll be able to avoid some of the technical difficulties we've seen in a couple of episodes. I have no idea what happened today. <laughs> scares me now. Karma. It, you stored up that, too much. Good well, luck. no, it was just, you know, things come in threes. It, it was destined to happen, so. Um, but anyway, so, again, outside of uh, outside of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, we've each got our own projects that we're working on. Um, so, Amy... When we're not recording here, where can we find you? What are some of the things that you have been doing lately? I'm, I'm hiding in my basement, making lots of things. So my Star Lord costume, I got my husband to do his airbrushing finally. So here's the guns. And I did everything. Oh, wow. Those came out great. I know. That so, is cool. So I need to do a little more weathering. But the the blue and the, all the, the burn stuff on the tips, that's with his airbrushing. And Love so, that. I mean, but I mean, yeah. And so. So, so those are 3D this. printed? No, these are toys. Okay. That I they're like the Ruby's toys and I cut these holes and I cut okay. out the hole on there. So I I tweaked them and I had to make got this it. guy so you're a lefty. Them. Awesome. So I had this guy cuz it used to be over on this side. Uh-huh. So this gotcha. part got moved. So that's my my guns. I'm pretty happy with them. They still need a little bit more work. We do have a 3D printer. So I've been working on my faced and rifle and I've showed you random bits of it. But here's what I have. And this is like a third of it maybe a third to like not quite half. And I finally got the grip printed. So I don't nice. know if you can see it. It's kind of hard because it's black, but it's going to go right there. Okay. So it's going to be a big rifle, like big. So yeah, there's that. that and then I made the so patches. Cool. So and I have other stuff. Those are awesome. I love those patches. That's my most recent stuff is that. All right. So where can we find you? That's right. Um, I am on Instagram and Facebook and Vero and Twitter at Coincidence Cosplay or Coincidence Cosp on Twitter because it's too long. And I try to post at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, but I try to do stuff. And I, I do have a YouTube page, but I don't ever do anything on it because I'm scared of doing videos by myself. So <laughs> eventually I'll get stuff up, I hope. Awesome. So. All right. And Jordan, what about you? Uh, this week I'm having a curtailed uh I'm not doing much during the week, but on Saturday morning, I'm continuing my uh, Saturday morning XCOM series, where I play XCOM at the same time as back when you were a kid, you would watch Saturday morning cartoons, complete with nostalgic commercials. Uh, Last time we had uh, such fun commercials as, uh, well, actually, no, Crossfire was a couple weeks ago. Point is, there's a lot of nostalgic commercials. It's the real highlight of the stream. Don't ask why. But if you dear listener have a nostalgic commercial you think belongs if you could uh, just uh, tweet at me um, i'm at splice stream splice stream is also my twitch handle uh so just follow me if you want to get updates there if you have a nostalgic commercial just find a youtube video of it and if you could tweet it at me that would help me a lot because uh it turns out that it's really hard to pick which commercials are the most nostalgic yeah those are actually kind of the main reason I watch. XCOM is great. It's a fun game, but the nostalgia really is what grabs me. It just it feels like I'm sitting down, you know, I want to grab a bowl of cereal and just lean back and 
watch commercials because what, apparently what, I was a tool of the system. Back where, then. where else are you going to remember the Super Soaker's motto was "Wetter is better." Wetter is better. <laughs> and I had I had the milk as a body good. I scraped my knee as a kid, and my mom was like, "Do you want a band aid?" And I was like, "No, I want some milk." milk <laughs> oh, the brainwashing was too good. It's true. Anyway, okay, um, and as for myself, uh, when I'm not here, I'm writing board game reviews over at the Innkeeper's Table at www.innkeeperstable.com. I actually just recently, uh, after a hiatus, I put up another one for a game called Eight Minute Empire, which, as it sounds like, it's essentially a game you can sit down and play in eight minutes. It's Think of it as Risk Ultra, Ultra, Ultra Light. Um, so... But it's a you know fun game, so head over there, check out the review. Um, you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I try, try to post over there. Um, whenever I get a new review up, I put up. And then if there's something that is board game related or related to the company that I want to get out, that's typically where, where I'll post things. Um, if you've enjoyed the show and you want to support us, the best thing that you can do is actually give us a five-star review over on iTunes. It really does a lot to help other listeners find us and grow the Sixer community. In addition to that, please be sure to share the podcast and videos with other Brandon Sanderson fans that you may know. Um, Before we sign off, Amy and Jordan, do you have any final thoughts you want to talk about regarding Mistborn or its place in the Cosmere? It's awesome. I I can't (laughs) wait to actually break down the rest of the books because... As fun as the first book is, the foreshadowing he managed to get into the first book that we couldn't really talk about because we haven't gotten to the other stuff yet is absolutely incredible and actually changes a lot of scenes in the first book. Mm -hmm. Yep, Cosmere Puppy to Instagram. That's right. Somebody called you. Yes, this is Cosmere Puppy. Again, this this is amazing for the audio. This is why you got to watch it live. You got to watch Puppy Dog. (laughs) That's why I'm always bending down if you watch the videos because she's throwing her toy constantly. No, I just I love the concept of Alabancy, <laughs> and I love that in each of the three books he focuses on a different magic system while keeping the ones that he's previously mentioned, and it, he just sort of grows it almost organically from there. So, all right. Um, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash Innkeeper's Table every two weeks on Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time, listeners can also find our videos on YouTube or iTunes by searching for, Cos- for Cosmere Studies. Follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at, at Cosmere Studies. Now, every week we talk about what we think of what's happening in the Cosmere, but we really, really want to know what you think. We'd love to hear your theories about the Cosmere, questions about the show, topics you'd like us to discuss, and more. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can send us uh, a tweet or you can contact us at Cosmere Studies at gmail.com on Instagram, Twitter, or in the comments section of our videos on YouTube. That'll do it for this week, but, uh, but we really want to thank you for watching. On behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, we're glad to have you. And always remember, there's always another secret. Oh.